Hello, Full Body family. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Full Body Crime Podcast. My name's Kayla, and without further ado, let's dive into today's episode. And please don't forget that this is not for small children. Well, it's not for medium or large children either. And listening to, listener discretion is advised. So in today's episode, we'll be covering another serial killer named John Jubert. I did see an article where he was named the schoolboy killer, but I only saw that in one, so I'm not positive this, if this was actually his nickname or not, but let's get into it. John Jubert was born on July 2nd, 1963 in Lawrence, Massachusetts, to parents Beverly and Joseph Jubert. He was a smart child, accelerating past age-associated milestones, and he even began reading at the age of just three years old. He continued to to display above-average intelligence throughout his upbringing, and he was even known to have an IQ of 123, which places him in the, quote, above-average and bright category. Now, at the age of eight years old, John's parents did divorce, and sole custody was awarded to his mother. John ended up completely resenting his mother. She was noted to be controlling, never let him see his father, and she was said to intervene in almost every single social interaction John had throughout his young life. Since his mother basically prevented John from having any real personal connections with his peers, this caused him to often be teased and made fun of. Now, backing up to before his parents even divorced, John was already experiencing some extremely sadistic behavior. Even at the young age of just six years old, research states that he had sexual fantasies that discussed murdering and cannibalizing his babysitter. This information was apparently discussed in three psychiatric reports on Jubert, and one of the psychiatrists even reported that his babysitter had completely done nothing wrong to him. She wronged him in no way, and there was absolutely no grudge towards her. And per Murderpedia.org, he saw her as, quote, just someone to kill. By his preteen years, his thoughts developed from vicious sexual fantasies to random crimes which included strangling and stabbing young women and children. In 1971, John attempted to gain more social interactions by joining the Cub Scouts, but at this time his murder fantasies were progressing at an alarming rate. He had severe mental health issues and thought about murdering pretty much any and all individuals, even people that were just walking down the street. He thought about, quote, tying and gagging those who resisted him, and he found pleasure in these terrible thoughts. By 1974, John's mother moved them out of Massachusetts and to Portland, Maine, where he settled in the small neighborhood of Oakdale. John continued to be socially awkward and have no strong, no established relationship with his peers, and by the age of 12, he admitted to also having homosexual tendencies, which made him even more susceptible to being bullied in that time. One year later, at the age of 13, John's aggressive behavior significantly escalated, and he stabbed a girl with a pencil and became sexually aroused when she cried in pain. The very next day, he thought, an, he thought and acted on a new plan, where he used a razor blade to cut a young girl as he rode his bike past her. He continued to be a really troubled child and would constantly bully others, both mentally and physically. On January 24th of 1980, a 27-year-old female named Vicki Goff was stabbed while walking home from her creative writing class at a nearby university. She explained the event as she saw a young man walk by and they even exchanged hellos. Everything seemed normal. Then moments later, she felt someone come behind her and cover her mouth. She felt what she described as a punch in her side and fell to the ground, and the young man ran away. When she was able to process what happened, Vicky discovered that she had actually been stabbed. The stab wound punctured her kidney, and she had to be surgically treated at the main medical center and required a one-week hospital admission. So Vicky's attack occurred on January 24th, and exactly two months to the exact date, on March 24th, Jubert attacked again. This time, it was a nine-year-old boy named Michael Whitman who was walking down the road when a young man on his bike cut his throat with an X-Acto knife. Luckily, this wound didn't reach his critical veins and arteries located in the neck, and he was able to make it home, but his wound ended up being two inches in length and required 12 stitches. Even though he had conducted these numerous acts of violence, no one had any idea who this vicious young man was. 
Although John was seemingly a terrible person, his teachers and peers had absolutely no idea. His Spanish teachers said that he was a great student, even doing well in his honors courses. He was even on his high school track team and played clarinet in the band. Now, he did end up graduating from his Catholic high school in the spring of 1981, and from high school he attended Norwich University in Vermont to study engineering. But this being his first time away from his mother and his first time having a little bit of freedom, he ended up not going to class, and he ended up eventually flunked out his freshman year of college. Just one year after his high school graduation in 1982, John Jubert acted on his first known murder. Jubert was riding his bike along a jogging trail in Portland, Maine, called the Back Cove Trail. And literally, this trail is exactly how it sounds. It wraps around the back of a cove. And after Googling the trail, it's actually extremely beautiful and looks super safe, especially in 1982 when kids still played outside and children seemed to almost be invincible. I mean, no one would suspect that in the middle of the day, in the middle of summer on a fairly populated trail, that something bad would happen to them or their children. But on August 22, 1982, at 7.45 p.m., 11-year-old Ricky Stetson was jogging on the Back Cove Trail when he was spotted by John Jubert. Prior to going on this jog, his father's last words to him were, Ricky, be careful and don't go too far. And I just want to rewind. I know it's 7.45 p.m. when Ricky went on this run, but if Maine's anything like California, which it could completely not be, but at 7.45 in the middle of August in summer, it usually doesn't start getting dark until around 9 p.m. So I imagine that it was still light outside when Ricky did decide to go on this run. But anyway, his father told him to be careful and not to go too far. But then John rode his bike next to Ricky until Ricky reached a more private area of the trail, and then John proceeded to attack the little boy. You guys, looking at pictures of Ricky, I about died. He was seriously the cutest little boy with red hair and freckles. You can just tell by looking at his pictures that he was a light in so many lives. But John Jubert decided to attack him on this jogging trail, and Ricky was murdered in a combination of strangulation and a single stab wound to the chest. Now, one piece of unique evidence that detectives had was a bite wound to Ricky's, the back of Ricky's leg, where there was also noted to be a stab wound with like a crisscross slash and an apparent attempt to cover the bite mark. Ricky's family knew something was terribly wrong when it became dark outside and he hadn't returned home. Unfortunately, they weren't able to find him that evening and Ricky was left overnight, partially undressed, stabbed, and strangled to death and his body wasn't actually found until the next morning by a motorist on her way to work. There, there were several people who identified a man fitting John's description as being on the trail that day and actually being seen near Ricky, but they didn't know who this man was or his name, so there was basically nothing investigators had to go off of. However, there was a man arrested for Ricky's murder, and he actually spent about six months in jail before he was released. And this man was cleared um, after investigators realized the bite marks on Ricky's body didn't match the sub suspect's dental map. So he was released, and Ricky's case went cold. After Ricky's murder, John enlisted into the military and moved to Nebraska, where he served time in the Air Force. Now, people in Nebraska had no idea that this murderer was in their state or neighborhoods, but this would all change on the early morning of September 18, 1983. In Bellevue, Nebraska, another adorable young man named Danny Joe Eberly was in the beginning stages of his early morning newspaper route when he disappeared. Danny Joe was just 13 years old and had a 70-stop paper route, and after he didn't return home, Danny's parents knew that something was wrong, and they became concerned and went to look for him, and they had found his bike along with all the other newspapers sitting in front of the fourth stop of his paper route. At this scene, there was absolutely no signs of a struggle, and Danny Joe's family and law enforcement officials had absolutely nothing to go off of, other than the fact that Danny simply vanished. His family reports that he was an extremely responsible child, and his paper routes were one of his main priorities, and he loved his bike and would have never just left it unattended. So they knew something was wrong because he wasn't just out somewhere playing like he would have taken his bike. The one piece of information investigators had was provided by Danny, jo Danny Joe's brother, who also delivered papers, and he said that for a few days leading up to Danny's disappearance, he was actually being followed by a white male in a tan van. 
but otherwise there was no information on this man, the van, or where in the world Danny Joe was. Three days after his disappearance, the Wahoo police conducted a mass search for Danny. Within 30 minutes of the search, Danny Joe Eberly's body was found covered in an area with high grass that was sitting alongside a gravel road. His body was discovered about six kilometers or four miles away from where his bike was. In a later confession to the crime, John Jobert states that he threatened Danny with a knife, covered his mouth, and ordered him to get into his vehicle. He then drove Danny to the gravel road where he stripped him down into his underwear, covered his mouth with surgical tape, tied him up, and brutally tortured Danny Joe before stabbing him over nine times, which eventually led to his death. When his body was examined, investigators also discovered that his throat was cut, and similar to Ricky's case, he also had a distinctive bite mark to his body. In Joe Jobert's, John Jobert's confession, he states, quote, I pulled out the knife and he said, please don't kill me. He then struggled a little bit, but I stabbed him in the back. When I had done that, he told me if I would just take him to the hospital, he wouldn't say anything. I didn't believe him, so I stabbed him again a couple of times. Investigators had no idea where to begin to find Danny Joe's killer. Their evidence was minimal, and they really had nowhere to go, and there was only the distinct bite mark and rope used to tie Danny's hands and feet. Now, this was a different rope that, that was white on the outside but multicolored on the inside, so that they, they did feel that this rope was fairly unique and a sufficient piece of evidence. But even with the bite mark and rope, there was basically no other clues for investigators to go off of, and John Jobert remains a free man. Detectives did follow numerous leads in the case and actually interviewed numerous people, pedophiles, child molesters that were in the Bellevue area, and they ended up arresting a man who had previously molested two boys right after the murder occurred. Additionally, this man failed a polygraph exam and his alibi was completely uncredible, but he did not fit the FBI's profile that they had created for Danny's murderer. With the lack of evidence and the connection with, there's and there being no connection between the man and Danny, he was eventually released. And after his release, the case went cold, very similar to Ricky's case. Even though investigators were following dead end leads, they knew they had to find Danny Joe's killer and find him quickly. Because if one thing was certain, it was that they were sure he would strike again. And on December 12th of 1983, their worst fears were confirmed. On this December 12th morning, a 12-year-old boy named Christopher Walden, who was another Bellevue, Nebraska resident, vanished while walking to school. The area where he vanished was approximately 5 kilometers and 3 miles away from where Danny Joe's body had been found. He had been missing for two days, and two days later, a few miles outside of town, a man was pheasant hunting when he discovered the body of Christopher Walden. During his confession, John Jubert stated that he spotted Walden that morning on his way to school, showed him his knife, and directed him to get into his car. He made Christopher strip down in his underwear and then ordered him to walk through the snow. This strong young man refused to lie down for Jubert, so John brutally murdered Christopher. Christopher Walden was a fighter, and he did put up a brief fight with John before he was overpowered and stabbed to death. Once again, his throat was lacerated, but in this case, Jubert had actually cut his throat so deeply that Christopher was nearly decapitated. One of the major differences in the Christopher in Christopher's case compared to Ricky and Danny Joe was that there was actually a witness. A woman had seen the abduction in action, but at the time, she had absolutely no idea that it was a kidnapping. The witness is quoted saying, well, at first I thought maybe it was a kid not doing what his parents wanted, and then I thought maybe it was a lover's quarrel. I mean, I really didn't think it was anything violent. That Sunday night when they had came and tell told me that they had found his body, that was just agonizing because I felt like it was my fault. I mean, I thought if I could have found that car before Sunday night, this little boy would be okay. John Jubert remained a free man, and he attempted one more attack before his capture. On January 11, 1984, he was circling around a church preschool, and the director took notice of his vehicle, and she found this car so suspicious that she memorized the car's license plate. After doing a few rounds around the building, 
John stopped and got out of his car to ask for directions, and if there was a phone inside that he could use. On guard, the preschool director told him no, and that's when John lunged at her and tried to shove her into the building. However, she was able to fight him off, and she got past him and ran. Memorizing the license plate, she had immediately went to authorities, and they traced this address back to John Jubert. At the time, he was actually driving a rental car as his tan vehicle was in the shop. But issued with a search warrant, investigators raided, raided John's Air Force barrack. In their search for evidence, they found something extremely familiar. Inside of a duffel bag, law enforcement officials found a rope, but not just any rope. A rope that was consistent with a rope that ha was white on the outside with multicolored strands on the inside that was used to tie up the hands and feet of Danny Joe, John's second victim. With this evidence, they questioned John Jubert about the recent murders, and he confessed to murdering the two innocent children, Danny Joe Eberly and Christopher Ward Wal uh, Walden. I'm sorry. He later would confess to Ricky's crime as well, and Ricky Stetson's family ended up being relieved that Jubert was arrested in Nebraska rather than Maine, because then he could receive capital punishment, where Maine does not have that system implemented. During an interview while on death row, John Jubert said, The murders provided material for my violent fantasies. That's all the gratification it was. I can't do anything except for apologize, and I am sorry, and it shouldn't have happened. When I was watching this apology, it was very chilling because it seemed so emotionless. You're literally a monster who took the lives of three innocent young boys and attacked numerous other peoples. And you just, like, he completely ruined the lives of families and altered the lives of numerous other individuals. And he just seriously looks completely cold and heartless and just like an evil monster. Jubert was eventually linked in Ricky's case and he was tried in both Nebraska and Maine for the murders he committed. In Maine, he was sentenced to life in prison, but in Nebraska, he was sentenced to death. On July 17, 1996, Jubert was the second man in Nebraska who died by the electric chair, and he could officially never steal the life of another person again. And those, my friends, are the tragic murders of Ricky Stetson, Danny Joe Eberly, and Christopher Warden. Walden. Why do I keep putting Warren and Walden? I have this guy's name mixed up. Christopher Walden. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode and enjoyed all the episodes thus far. I did redo, redo case one of Adrian Jones, but it seems to only be updated on Spotify, Spotify and Google Podcasts and not quite on Apple Podcasts yet. So I'm still working out the kinks with that. But overall, please subscribe to us so you're always the first to know when there's a new episode. Please go follow us on Twitter at Full Bodied Crime. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram, FB underscore crime, so that you can see all the pictures associated with this case. Check out our website, full-bodiedcrime.com, where you can also find the sources for this episode. And go like and subscribe to us on YouTube and Facebook, Full-Bodied Crime. And last but not least, please go review this podcast on Apple, Spotify, Spotify, why? What is with my verbiage right now? Spotify or Google Podcasts. Your feedback is extremely important to me, and I appreciate every single listener. And, um, well, y'all.